but if you already have Hi guys, so welcome for today's class. We'll be doing a file, not advanced file. Eh? So we'll be doing a file. So today we'll be looking at consolidation of the group. So now group is one of the major topics which will be tested. Eh? It's one which requires a, a deep understanding. So kindly make sure you have a good uh, connectivity and also make sure you follow until they do only take one hour 30 minutes. So, but for a group, it will not be end uh, by today. Group require like two classes, two or three classes, but I'll make sure I'll, within two classes it will be done. So kindly make sure you attend this one from the beginning up to the end. And actually the introduction is very important. And then also for the next class, make sure you don't miss. So group must be tested. Eh? It's one of the major examinable area. So I'm hoping you have your past papers. So I want us to go direct to our uh, to our discussion for today. So I'm hoping you are ready. So make sure also you have your calculator, the past paper and the calculator, those are the requirements. Then I'll be asking random questions. So kind of be posting your answer. From where I am, I can be able to see all your answers, what you are posting, yeah? So kind of if I ask a question, kind of, you don't have to speak, yeah? And in case you have a question, just type it, yeah? But unless it's a burning question, that's when you raise your hand. So those are the guidance, yeah? For those who are the first timers, there we have an option. You can raise your hand, then we'll unmute you, and then you can be able to ask the question directly. Also, for those who are doing the revision at home, kinda you can uh, you can also get the revision partners from Somia Kenya. Somia Kenya has one of the best revision partners, so kinda you can get them, which have all the settings from twenty uh, from twenty fifteen. September 2015 up to date, including the May 29, uh, December 2019. So now let's start group or consolidation. So what, and when you say we have group or consolidation, this is why you have a group of companies, not just one company. This is why you have more than one company. In this case, we have one company which acquires another company to gain what you call the control. Now in that perspective, that's what you call the group. That's what we're looking at the group perspective. Also look at how do we consolidate the financial statement? When do we consolidate? When do we not consolidate? So because in this case, when one company controls another one or one company acquires another company, more than half, that means more than 50%. So now that company being acquired is known as the subsidiary, a subsidiary. And then the company which has acquired it, it's known as the parent or the holding company. Now that's what entails the group. So when one company acquires another one, more than 50%, that's what we call the subsidiary. Then also one company can also acquire another company between 20% to 50%. So now, anything between 20 to 50%, that one is not a subsidiary. Now that one is known as either an associate or when it's 50%, it's known as the joint control or jo yeah, joint control. They have the joint control or joint venture, a joint venture. So you have to differentiate between the two. Now for it to be a subsidiary, it must be more than 50%. So if one company acquires another company 50%, that one is not a subsidiary. It must be 50 plus one. Eh? So anything between 20 to 50%, it's an associate or the joint venture. Anything below 20, that's just a normal investment. So that's what we'll be entailing our group. So now let's go to the whiteboard so that I can explain more. So we're looking at consolidation. Consolidation or the group. So, and how does the group work? We have said that group happens that whenever we have company A, we have company A, company A acquires another company, let's call it company B. Between 
or more than 50%, it's more greater than 50%. Now let's assume company A acquires company B 80%. Now, how do we call this B? Now, this is what we call a subsidiary. It's called a subsidiary. And this company is known as the holding or the parent company. A has acquired B 80%. Now this B becomes a subsidiary. Now a subsidiary, since we have more than half of the shares, that means for the subsidiary, we can have what we call control. We can control them. Also, company A can acquire another company, let's call it company C, between 20% to 50%. Now, for example, let's assume it's 40%. Company A acquired C, 40%. Now, in this case, this is what you call a NASO sheet. And when it's 50%, it's known as a joint venture. But now for the joint venture, we have some uh, condition which has to be met for it to be a joint venture. Eh? Now for the joint venture, there must be an agreement to have what we call joint control. Now, another difference between a subsidiary and an associate is that for the associate, we cannot control them. Subsidiary, you are controlling them since we have more than half of the shares. Now for the associate, you cannot control them, but you have what we call significant, a significant influence. That means subsidiary, you can control them. But for associate, you cannot control them, but you can have what you call significance influence. Eh? What do you mean by the significance influence? Significance influence, that means you can participate in their financial matters, operating matter. And whenever they are sitting on the board, you have your representation. But if for the control, that means you can become, it's like a dictator. Eh? You can be able to dictate to them. But this one, you cannot dictate to them. You have just have significance influence. So now that's the difference between a subsidiary and an associate. Then another thing you need to know, when company A acquires company B, 80%, this 80%, there is another proportion of 20% in B, which has not been acquired by A. How do we call that? Now this 20 is what we call NCI, or what we call the non-controlling interest. This is what we call the non-controlling interest. And for non-controlling interest, it's also known as the minority minority shareholders or minority interest. So if one company acquires the other one 80%, the other proportion not acquired, the 20%, it's known as the non-controlling interest. Now that's all about the group perspective. That's the introduction. That's the introduction. So now let's look at something else. We look at something else. Still under that, you need to know about the group. And one after you have been able to differentiate between the subsidiary and an associate, what else are you supposed to know? So, hoping we are there now. So consolidation of the business combination refers to bringing together of separate entities into one reporting entity. In that case, this result, uh, the, uh, the result of all business combination into one entity or the acquired obtained controls over one or more other entity, acquires control. If you control more than one company, that's what we call a subsidiary. Then business combination brings about parent subsidiary relationship. So in group, it's looking at the parent and the subsidiary. Then we have said that what's a subsidiary? A subsidiary is an entity controlled more than half or more than 50% of its equity, in, uh, equity shares. So a subsidiary is an, uh, an entity that is controlled by another entity for more than 50% of its equity capital. I repeat again. Now, in case company A acquired company B 50%, that one is not a subsidiary. Subsidiary must be greater than 50%. Then we have what, is called, uh, what we call control. Now control is the power to govern the financial and operating policy uh, decision of the university. Then we'll have what we call consolidated financial statement. Then group, group comprises both the subsidiary, the parent, and the associate. Then we have what we call the NCI or the non-controlling interest. We have said that the non-controlling interest is the proportion of the net asset in the subsidiary that is not owned by the parent company. And how do we measure or how do we value the NCI? So IFRS 3 allows two alternative methods of determining NCI. Number one, 
number one, NCI at the proportionate share, at the proportionate share, like that one, 20% eh, of the fair value of the subsidiary net asset. Or number two, NCI also at fair value. Fair value is the market value. So that's the two alternatives you can use to determine the NCI. Either the proportionate, uh, proportionate share in the net and subsidiary net asset, or number two, at fair value. Now let's go to what we call the group structure. Group structure. And a group structure, we have three structures. Number one, we are looking at the group structures. Group structure. Number one, we have what we call horizontal structure. Now for the horizontal structure is where we have company A acquires more than one subsidiary. Has B, has C, has D. Like this one is controlling 80%. We are controlling 60%, we are controlling 75%. Now that's what you call a horizontal structure where all the children, they have the same parent or one company controlled more than one subsidiary. Then number two, we have what you call vertical structure. Vertical structure. Now vertical structure happens when we have company A, company A acquires another control in company B. Let's assume 90%, where com company A controls B 90%. Then company B, now the subsidiary, this is subsidiary. The subsidiary across another company, let's call it C, like 80%. Now this is what we call sub subsidiary. So this is the parent, subsidiary, and sub subsidiary. So in this case, A controls B directly 90%. That means the non-controlling interest in B is 10%. 90% is the control, the non-controlling interest is the remaining part, which is 10%. Now, company B control company C. But in this, we'll come to see later that A is the one which will pay the group account. How does A, being the major parent, control C? How does A control C? Now, company A controls company C indirectly through company B. So in this case, company A controls C. This is how it controls. You take 90% of 80%, which is 72%. That's how A controls C through B, 90% of the 80%. That means the non-controlling interest will be 28%. Then number three, that was the second, uh, the number two structure. We have what we call mixed structure. Now for the mixed structure happens when, the mixed structure happens when we have company A, we have company A, company A across another company B. Let's assume like 70%. So that means this is the parent, this is a subsidiary. Then company A decides to acquire another company. Let's call it company C, like 30%. Company A controls B 70%, also has another company. It's controlling another company at 30%. Then this subsidiary decides to buy share in this parent answership. And now let's assume acquires like, uh, let's assume 35%. I hope now you're getting the structure. Unimzazi, the subsidiary. Then the parent acquires another share and apata kamtoto kengine. Then now in this case, the subsidiary, the mtoto decides to acquire some share in the other child. Eh? So how does this, uh, how does this, uh, how does A control C? Now, remember B is a subsidiary to A. B is a subsidiary to A. But is C a subsidiary or an associate to A? Is B a subsidiary or an associate to A? Can you post your answers there? Can you post there? Is it a subsidiary or is it an associate? C. Is C an associate to A or is C an uh, a subsidiary to B? If it's an associate, just write A. 
with a subsidiary just write as can see uh -huh. Uh -huh. give me your answers i can see there uh -huh. can see associate 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 uh -huh. i can see uh -huh. uh, someone i'm going is there uh -huh. subsidiary a a a <laughs> so now let's come back here so <laughs> i think it's only two anode huh? subsidiary uh -huh. so it's only one who have gotten correct <laughs> so now let's get it huh? now this i'll get it how does a control c we need to know is it a subsidiary is it an associate a control c directly 30 percent that means a control c directly 30 percent also a control c indirectly through b because b is a subsidiary so also control is directly so how do you get that it's 70 percent of 35 percent 70 percent of that five percent so it's 70 percent times that five percent and in that case how much do you get 0 0.7 that five and you get 24 point five so that means the total will be 54 0.5 percent so have that changed your decision now so that means c is also a subsidiary to a so it can be a subsidiary it can be an associate eh? this i will get it control is directly 30 percent and then indirectly there will be 70 percent of the 35 percent good so that was the group structure we have those three structures so now let's look at something else then I want you to get uh, to note this. I need you to note this. Number one. Number one. You can write it somewhere. It's just small thing. Eh? That only we only consolidate subsidiary. Note that we only control uh, consolidate subsidiary. Or after you get the notes, eh? I've already included it here. I've written it as an NB here. That only subsidiary is consolidated. That's number one. And then for the ordinary share capital and share premium, you only recognize for the parent. Those are the two items you need to get them clearly. That for the ordinary share capital and the share premium, those are the equity items. You only recognize for the parent only. Then when you're doing consolidation, you only consolidate financial statement of the parent and the subsidiary so in this case that means that we don't consolidate associate because associate we don't control we only have the significance influence then let's look at something else so as we have seen that whenever you have the parent and then the parent has a subsidiary and then has an associate so in that case the parent company needs to prepare the uh, consolidated or what you call the group account so the parent company need to prepare at the end of the financial year, they need to prepare what's called the group account. That's when, whenever you see the financial statement for equity, they don't write equity limited, it's equity group or KCB group. Eh? Now that's what we call a consolidated financial statement because like equity has other investment, has invested in other business. Eh? So that means they have to prepare one financial statement for all its subsidiary. But we have some exemptions. Exemption when the company is exempted from preparing consolidated financial statement. And one of the exemptions, yeah, the exemption, when the parent itself is a wholly owned subsidiary, when the parent itself is a wholly owned subsidiary. For example, I have seen that if company A control company B like 70% and then B control C like 80%. So in this case, A is the parent to B, but B is the parent to C. C A. B and a Jua B. But in this case, B is exempted from, uh, from preparing the group because parent itself, it's a wholly or fully owned subsidiary from another company. And that's what you are saying here that when the parent itself, when the parent itself, it's a wholly owned subsidiary or partially owned subsidiary of another entity, like in this case. In this case, B can be exempted from preparing the group account because itself is a partially owned subsidiary of another company. So that means in this case is the, uh, the original, uh, the parent who will prepare the group account. Then number two, 
If it's debt or equity instrument, I'll not trade it in the local or foreign public market. What does that mean? So that means whenever the company is a private company, private company is not a must, they have to prepare the group account. That's what number two means. That it's debt or equity instrument is not traded in the local or foreign market. Then number three, if it's an investment entity, like Britam, Cyton, Centum. What do you mean by investment entity? If you take a case of like Centum, Centum, they are there just to invest in certain company. Like uh, Centum has more than 100 companies they have invested it. Like for example, if you go to, to Livers Mall, they provided a capital of at least 90% of the capital for two Livers Mall. So you see that one qualified to be a subsidiary. Now, assume now it has more than 100 companies. Do you think they can be able to consolidate all the 100 companies? So in that case, they'll be exempted. If it's an investment entity, investment means that they only provide the capital. So in that case, they'll be exempted from preparing group financial statement. Now, those are the major three. Still, we have others, but can't they get the three? Then we have what we call the goodwill on acquisition. What's the goodwill? Now, goodwill, IFRS 3 defines goodwill as the future economic benefit arising from the asset that are not capable of being individually identified and separately recognized. Also, is the difference between the purchase consideration and the net asset acquired. We'll come to explain what's, who are that. I need you to get the second definition when, eh? that the goodwill is the difference between the purchase consideration and the net asset acquired. That means that you take the cost of investment, you raise the fair value of net asset acquired, then you, raise, uh, you get the goodwill, the difference between the two. Then we have two methods of computing goodwill, two methods of computing goodwill. Number one, we have the full goodwill method, and number two, we have the partial goodwill method. Now, for the full goodwill method, this is where the goodwill of the subsidiary is determined as a whole. That means, that means the goodwill will comprise the parent and the NCI goodwill. Then, number two here, number two, we have what we call the partial goodwill method. Under partial goodwill method, this only, the parent goodwill is recognized. So this is what I mean, this is what I mean. Let me explain what we mean by the group, uh, group goodwill. We are looking at goodwill. And we have said that the goodwill is the difference between the purchase consideration and the net asset acquired. Now, assuming you have company A and company B, a company A acquired company B 90%. Company A acquired the shares of B 90%. Now, Assuming company A paid B 500 million, company A to acquire the shares in B were paid 500 million, but the net asset of B, B was worth only 450 million. In this case, I repeat again, that A acquired B 90%. In this case, the value of company B, its net asset is 450. But A, they paid it, uh, they paid, they acquired them for 500. So that means there was a gain. Eh? That means B got a gain of 50 million. Now, B will report a gain of 50 million, but A will record a goodwill of 50. Now, this is what we call the goodwill. The difference between the purchase consideration and the net asset acquired. Now, in that case, that's what we call the full goodwill method full goodwill method. Then we have said they have two, uh, two types of determining goodwill. We have the full goodwill method. Then we have said, number two, we have what we call the partial goodwill. Now for the partial goodwill, you only recognize the parent proportion goodwill. This is what I mean. We acquired company B 500, but the net asset acquired was worth 450. But in this case, remember you only acquired 90% of the 450. So in this case, you take 450 times 90 percent. Now that's what we call the partial goodwill. Of the 450, which is the net asset, we only acquired 90 percent. So it's 500 minus the 90 percent of 450. Now what you get there, now that's what we call the partial goodwill. But for the full goodwill, it recognizes the goodwill of the subsidiary as a whole. That's for the parent and the NCI. 500 minus 450. That's all. So now let me take you back. Take you back. So this is how we get the goodwill. Okay, then you need to, uh, to get this formula, correct? 
So for the full goodwill, just take the purchase consideration. Then, in case you are given the fair value of NCI, you add the fair value of NCI asset, you get the total. Then you raise the net asset acquired. Now for the net asset acquired, remember the net asset is the difference between asset minus liability, which is equivalent to the equity. So in this case, you'd be looking at the equity because the equity item, they do, actually they usually don't change. So for the net asset, we compare things to do with ordinary share capital, share premium. Then for the retained earnings, you need to note that for the retained earnings, we always take pre-acquisition retained earnings. We have pre and we have the post. Eh? Pre means before, before we acquired them at the date of acquisition, how much was the retained earnings? Then in case we have reserve like revaluation, you also take pre-acquisition reserves. So I repeat again, for the net asset, you take the ordinary share capital, share premium. For the reserves and the retained earnings, you take pre-acquisition retained earnings and pre-acquisition reserve. Then you get the total. Now the difference between the two, you get the uh, for goodwill. Or for the partial goodwill, just take the purchase consideration. You raise the net asset, that's ordinary share capital, share premium, pre-acquisition retained earnings, and pre-acquisition reserves. Then what you get there, you multiply by the proportion. Assuming the proportion was 90% or 80%, you multiply by that, then you minus. That's how you get the partial goodwill. Good. Now let's go to what we call investment in associate and joint venture. Now, as with a joint venture, we have said that this one you acquire between 20% and 50%. And that one is regulated by IS 28. We have said that in the consolidated financial statement, we don't consolidate associate. We only consolidate subsidiary. So an associate is an entity over which uh, the investor has a significant influence. But for the subsidiary, we say that they have the control. But for uh, associate, we only have significant influence. So what's significance influence? Now significance influence is the power to participate in the financial and operating policy decision of the investee. And when an entity holds 20% to 50%, between 20 to 50% of the voting power, now they will get the voting power through the equity, directly or indirectly, it will be presumed to have a significance influence. But if the voting power is less than 20%, it would be presumed to have no significant influence and hence would be recognized as an investment. So if uh, you control, if you acquire share like 10%, 15%, 18%, that one does not qualify to be an associate. Eh? Now that one will qualify just to be a normal investment. So the existence of the significant influence by an entity is usually evidenced in one or more of the following ways. How can the company know that they have significant influence? Number one, Representation on the board of director of the university, also participation in the policy making process, including dividend policy, material transaction between the entity and the university, then also interchange of managerial personnel. Maybe you get that we have the technical or we have the professional moving from the parent company to the subsidiary, the, from the subsidiary to the parent. Also provision of technical, uh, essential technical information. Then how do you account for associate? Now, associate at joint venture will be accounted for using the equity method. We accounted for using the equity method. So we have said that we don't consolidate associate or joint venture, but we shall account uh, them using the equity method. How do we account using the equity method? This is how we account using the equity method. This is how the equity method works. Now for the equity method, for this method, you just take the purchase consideration, the purchase consideration, then you add post acquisition changes in net asset, post acquisition changes in net asset. Now most of what changes usually is either the retained earnings or the liberation reserve, liberation reserve. That's what we call the post acquisition changes in net asset. This is what I mean. Assuming the purchase consideration was 400, then retained earning at the date of acquisition, assuming it was 50 at the date of acquisition, but now at the date of acquisition it was 50, but now it's an amount of 90. So to get the post acquisition, we'll take 90 at the date of acquisition was 50. So that means it has changed by 40. So we'll take 40, 
times, now assuming you are controlling this associate, 40%. That's how you get that. Then reserve, you do the same. Assuming the revolution reserve at the rate of acquisition was 20, but now it's 25. So that means they have changed by five. Eh? So it is 25, and the rate of acquisition was 20, so that means it has changed by five. Then you multiply by the control. If you are controlling them 40%, you get that. And then you raise impairment. Impairment of goodwill. Now that's how you get <coughs> your account for investment in associate. Now what you get here, you'll take it to part of non-current asset. It's part of non-current asset. It's a long-term investment. Good. So there I have in, uh, indicated what's the equity method. And for the equity method, for the equity method, yeah, it's a method of accounting whereby the investment is initially recognized at cost and adjusted thereafter for post-acquisition changes in net asset. Then we have exemptions. What is joint venture? Joint venture, the uh, joint venture and the associate, they are kind of the same. Eh? So uta pitia, also type of joint arrangement. We'll go through that. Yoniki Gereza too. Then let's go to specialized transaction. Specialized transaction. And here, this is the uh, point you need to pay attention. If you want to get the group correctly, this is the point you need to pay your attention for specialized transactions. So what are the specialized transactions? So I have uh, majorly classified them into three. Actually, there are more. There are actually eight. But in this case, if you want to pass the CASNEB exams, kind of you need to get the first three. They need to be at your fingertips. So number one, we have what we call the intergroup balances. Eh? Now, whenever I have intergroup balances, first of all, don't read what is written there. First of all, listen. Eh? So for the intergroup balances, this is where one company owes the other. For example, we have company A, we have company B. Company A sells to B goods on credit. So if company A sells goods to B on credit, in the books of company A, we record B as account receivables. Then company B, so we'll save company A as account payable. You need to get the difference between the two. So in that case, whenever you are preparing the group account or you are doing consolidation, the intergroup balances, that's account receivable, account payable, will be eliminated in full from both receivable and account payable. Then number two, we have what we call, or first of all, let me explain that. Eh? So let me explain that. One of the special transactions is intergroup. Intergroup balances. <clears throat> and we have said that intergroup balances, we are looking at debtors or account receivables and account payables. That's what we are looking at. So how does that, this happen? Assuming you have company A and we have company B, company A acquired company B or company B acquired company A. And then during the post acquisition, company A sold good to B worth 120 on credit. A sold good to B worth 120 on credit. So that means company A will save company B from the, uh, in the financial statement as part of account receivable or the data. Also in company B, we'll also record 120, but in this case B, we record company A as the account payables. That's what we mean, intergroup balances. Now, during consolidation, in the account data, who are at 120, B also will eliminate 120, but then is in Asia. So in short, what, we, uh, what do they do? Eh? So that means they set off. So in my side, I'm showing 120. From your side, you are showing 120. Now, during consolidation, it's like to me one. Eh? So in that case, what you do, you eliminate the both. And if I'm showing 120, also you should be showing one, 120. The amount should be in agreement. But in some case, you may get that. In my case or company, I'm showing 120 million. But on your side, you are only showing 100 million. That means there's a difference of 20. Now, this 20 is what we call cash in transit. That's what we call cash in transit. This means that in my side, I'm showing 120. 
On your side, it was 120, but you wrote for me a check of 20 million. You wrote for me a check of 20 million. That means immediately after you wrote the check, ukatoa 20, so ikabaki angapi? They are handed, these they are handed here. But now this check has not yet been presented in the books of A, that's why I'm still showing how much? 120. So I repeat again that the intergroup balances should be in agreement. Here I'm showing 120, also the other side should be showing 120. But in case there's the differences, the difference becomes the cash in transit. Now, this is what will happen. In my debtors, I'll eliminate 120, but from your receivables, uh, from your payable side, remember you had already recorded, eh? you only remove 20, this is what you had. Eh? But this 20, 120, this 20 when I tell them, pertain to what we call the cash of the bank. I know you have not understood anything here. Eh? I did ignore that. We'll come to, uh, to see it eh? when we'll be doing the practical question. That was the first one, the intergroup balances. Intergroup balances. Now let's go to the second uh, special transaction. The second one. The second one. So that was number one, intergroup balances. First of all, let's go through it. So this refers to the intercompany indebtedness. In this case, uh, it's a case where the group company owes each other. Intergroup balances are eliminated in full on consolidation from both account receivable and account payable. That's what we are saying. From receivable you eliminate, from the payable you eliminate. <clears throat> Any cash in transit need to be adjusted before eliminating the intergroup balance. And this is what I mean. You debit the payable, you credit the receivables. Then number two, we have what we call the intergroup sales and what we call unrealized profit on closing stock. So this one are divided into two parts. So for the intergroup sales, intergroup sales kindly note that they are eliminated in full intercompany sales. This is why one company sells good to another company, either on cash or either on credit. Eh? That intergroup sales should be eliminated in full from both sales and cost of sales. Now this is what I mean, this is what I mean. So we are looking at intergroup, intergroup sales and unrealized profit on closing stock. Assuming you have company A and we have company B. Company A sells good to B worth 120 on credit. Company A sells good to B on credit. So how will this be affected in the income statement? Now we go back to the income statement. If A sold good to B, that means A recorded a sales. But B on the other side recorded purchases, of which purchases is part of cost of sales. Company A sold good to B. So that means A recorded a sale, B recorded a purchase of which is part of cost of sale. Now, during consolidation, we have said that intergroup sales should be eliminated in full from both sales and cost of Sale. So from the sales, you eliminate 120. From cost of sale, you eliminate also 120. Now that's what we call intergroup sales. Now let's go to number two. How do we treat for unrealized profit on closing stock? Now for the unrealized profit, number one, you have to differentiate between, we have what we call margin and we have what we call markup. Now, margin is usually on sales. So if we say that oh, this one is on sales and this one is on cost, kind of you need to differentiate the two. Eh? So kind of get this concept. If I say that A sold good to B at a margin of 10, and if you want, you want to get the profit, eh? a margin of 10, it will be just 10 out of 100. If the margin of 20 will be 20 out of 100. A margin of 30, 30 over 100. Now. Let's go back to markup. Company A sold good to B. You see, it's sold, that's sales. So how do we convert markup to margin? So if company A sold good to B at a markup of 10, markup of 10, so it's 10 out of 110. A sold good to B at a markup of 20, it will be 20 out of 120. Markup of 50, it will be 50 out of 150. This is what I'm doing, yeah? If it's 10 out of 100, if you want to convert this one to margin, this is what I'm doing. Eh? You just take this 10, you just, you add it there. So it will be 10 out of one, 10. 
Now, assuming company A sold good to B at a markup of a third, a markup of a third. Kwa hivyo itakuwa ngapi? So this one will be one over four. Eh? If you are converting markup to margin, because it's this one, you just add it there. So whenever you have markup, if it's 10, it's 10 out of 110, 20 out of 120, 50 out of 150. So now how else you convert that? Good. So now let's go back to the unrealized profit. For unrealized profit, for unrealized profit. So now assuming, assuming company A sold good to B worth 120, and they reported a markup of 20. Markup of 20. So if you want to know the unrealized profit. If they had already made a markup of 20, so you'll take 20 out of 120. Remember, I had already sold good to be worth 120. So that means A had already made a profit of 20. Now, how do we treat this 20? How do we treat this 20? This is how you treat. You add this 20 to cost of sales, but you less it from the closing stock this means you debit you credit so let me take you back to this again we have said that for intergroup sales intergroup sales you eliminate it in full the whole 120 regardless whether they sold or they not they never sold eh? so for the intergroup sales you eliminate them in full from both sales and cost of sales then for unrealized profit what you get there as an unrealized profit, you add it to cost of sales, then you eliminate it from the closing stock. So up now you're together. So that's a second specialized transaction. So now let's get uh, something else. Get something else. Let's go to intergroup sale of fixed asset. Intergroup sale of fixed asset. Intergroup sale of fixed asset. Number three, intergroup sale of fixed. Intergroup sale of fixed asset. So now, number two was intergroup sales. That was normal sales of in the inventory. So in this case, we are looking at intergroup sale of fixed asset. Now this happens whenever we have company A, company A decides to sell an item of plant or equipment, that's an current asset, eh? to be. Let's assume this item had cost 100 million. That was cost. Now company A wishes to sell it to B. So you see for A, they are there to make, uh, they are there to make profit. So when selling to B, they have to make a profit. Now let's assume company A sold to B this asset at 120 million. At 120 million. So A, it had cost 100, but they have decided to sell it to B they made a profit of 20. There is a profit of 20. So now this profit of 20, how do we treat this? So it's the same as unrealized profit. For all unrealized profit, you add it to cost of sales, but you eliminate from PPE. You add it, you credit. Or this means you debit, you credit. I repeat again, for this profit they made here, 100, they sell it at 120. This profit of 20, you add it, the unrealized profit, you take it to the cost of sales, then you eliminate it from PPE. Then, remember this being a fixed asset, it's something that's depreciable. Now let's go to the depreciation. Being a fixed asset, it means it's being depreciated. Now, assuming the uh, depreciation rate uh, across the group is 10%, it's 10%. Now, to me, that means I'll show a depreciation or have been depreciating at 10% of 100, it will be 10. But to you, remember you'll take 10%, your cost is 120, so it will be 10% of 120, which is 12. So here we had a difference of 20, which is unrealized profit. In this case, from 10 to 12, you see in this case, it's 10% of 100, that means in my accounts, I've been showing a depreciation of 10. But in your, in your accounts, you'll be showing 10% of your cost, your cost is 120. So which will be 12. So you see that there is a difference between 10 and 12. There is a difference of two. Now, this two is what we call overcharged depreciation. And how do you treat this overcharged depreciation? Is the vice versa. What you have done here, 
you do the vice versa. You add it to PPE, you credit cost of sales. So that means you debit the PPE, you credit the cost of sales. So that's the difference. So, and how can you get these two? These two, you can also do this. Eh? Remember the depression was 10%. It's 10% of this profit you made of 20, which is two. So for you to get the overcharged depreciation, you just take the depreciation rate times the overcharged or the unrealized profit. So that means to the PPE, whenever you'll be consolidating, eh? assuming you, have the, you are preparing the PPE account, you'll bring, remember you're consolidating the two company, A, company B. For them, company A, they can show 100. For company B, they'll show an amount of 120. But remember, this is the same, same, it's the same, same item. Eh? It's the same, same item. But the only difference is the cost. So what you'll do, remember this 100, I already put a profit of 20. That's when it's coming to 120. So what you'll do, I'll just eliminate that 20 so that they can be the same. So you eliminate the unrealized profit. And the unrealized profit, you had made a profit of? 20, so that if a key 100, 100. So now that one is a uniform. Now, this 20, this 20 will also uh, make you overcharge your deposition by two. So now that two, you add it back. That's when you're saying you debit the PPE. So you add back the overcharge deposition, which is two. And then from there, you cross. What you get as the balance carry down here, now that's what you take to the group financial statement good i hope you are following on that so those are the major specialized transaction number one was the intergroup balances and we say that for the intergroup balances you eliminate them in full from both the receivable and payables and they should be in agreement then number two we have said that we have intergroup sales and unrealized profit so intergroup sales should be eliminated in full from both sales and cost of sales. Then, in case of unrealized profit, unrealized profit you added to cost of sales, then you eliminate from the closing stock. And then lastly, number three, we had intergroup sale of fixed asset. We said that for the fixed asset, we have two transactions here. Number one, we have, how do you adjust for cost of sales? Eh? We have said, uh, I mean for the unrealized profit. For unrealized profit, we have said that you add it to cost of sales, you eliminate from the PPE. And then also another transaction is how do we account for overcharge depreciation? Is the vice versa. You add it back to the PPE, you eliminate it from the cost of sale. Good. So now you can put, in case you have any question, eh? just post it there. And just post it there. Before now we can go to an illustration. So good, now let's try an, an, an illustration. <clears throat> September 2015, question one. September 2015, question one. September 2015, question one. I'm hoping everyone is there now.
hoping you are there. So we are told that on 1st October 2014, P Limited acquired 60% of the equity share capital of S. So it's 60%, that means it's a subsidiary. So P acquired 60% of the equity share capital of S Limited uh -huh, in a share exchange of two shares of P Limited for three shares of S. On this date, the share of P were trading at eight. So in this case, they were not paid in cash. So in this case, they were paid through the issue of shares. That's what you call share for share exchange. Then number two, below are the financial statement of the two companies for the year ended that first March, 2015. I want you to get something here. We are told that, can let's be here? On 1st October, 2014, P limited acquired 60%. So that was on 1st October, 2014. That was the date. Then, Below are the financial statement of the two companies for the year ended that first March 2016. So you need to compute or you need to know what we call the post acquisition period. So from first, we acquired them on 1st October 2014, but the year ends on that first March 2015. So kindly, can you compute how many months and then you post there? If possible, to me, a bit dollar. So kindly post there. Arnold, I can see six, Wangari six, uh -huh. Galaxy six, uh -huh. Redemptor six, Winnie six, yeah, Bed six, yeah, correct, it was six months eh? from 1st October. So it's from October to that first March 2015. So that means the post period of post acquisition period will be six months. So now let's continue. We are given the income statement there for the two companies. Then also you're given the statement of financial position. Let's go to additional information number one. The issue of the share on acquisition of S Limited had not yet been recorded by P. Had not yet recorded by P. And then from the statement, what you can see, for those who attended the last class for published financial statement, eh, you can see this the same as published financial statement. It's just a summary. So that means for you to prepare the group account, they usually prepare the uh, group account from published financial statement of each company. Mm -hmm. Let's go to additional information number two. As at the date, as at the acquisition date, the fair value of S limited asset were equal to their carrying amount, except for an item of plant, which had a fair value of 2 million in excess of the carrying amount. The plant had a remaining use fry for five years, as at, uh, as at the acquisition date. S Limited has not revalued its asset. Number three, sales from S to Peterson Limited in the post acquisition period amounted to eight. That's what you call intergroup sales. Then number, uh, you are told that S Limited marked up or made a markup of 40%. Then 2.8 million of this good at cost of P Limited were still included in the inventory as at that first March 2015. Then number four, <clears throat> S Limited trade receivable in crude 800 due from P. Now that's what we call the intergroup balances, mm -hmm. which did not agree with the uh, corresponding payables. <clears throat> Remember we said that they have to be, to, be, to be in agreement. And in case they don't agree, we say the difference is what? Can you repost there? In case, the account receivable and account payable are not in agreement. We say the difference is what? So pause there. Yeah, correct. I can see yeah, you are listening. Eh? Yeah, the difference will be cash in transit, correct. Then we go to note number five. <coughs> P limited as a policy of accounting for any non-controlling interest at fair value. The fair value of goodwill attributable to non-controlling interest in S was 2.4 million. So that means in this case we'll be using full goodwill. Then number five, neither of the company declared dividend in the year ended that first March 2015. None of the company declared that. 
then, okay, for the purpose of passing the exam, kindly note the following. For the purpose of uh, passing the exams, we have some things. You don't have to stress yourself in an exam to compute. Number one, goodwill. In an exam, kindly, not unless you are very smart, eh? goodwill, retained earning, and the NCI, those three items. Kindly, don't struggle much because high chances you will get it wrongly. For every sittings, actually, it's only like 5% who got that one correctly. So you can ignore, but that's why I'm saying it's only for exam purposes. Eh? But kind of you need to get this knowledge. Number one, could you how to compute goodwill? Because that one is, it will be hectic for some student. Also retained earnings, as well as the NCI. Those three items, don't struggle much. Eh? Yeah, and, as, and even, uh, even if you don't have those three, you can still get 20 out of 20 in that question. So now let's go to adjustment. So let's go back to the introduction. We need to account for the shares. We are told that on 1st October, P Limited acquired 60% of the equity share of S in share exchange of two shares of P Limited for three shares of S Limited. So this is what we mean. This is the group structure. So we are looking at September 2015, question one. P acquired S 60%. So that means S is a subsidiary of P. And then the post acquisition period is six months. So now we want to determine the purchase consideration. How much did P paid S? So in this case, you are told that they were acquired through the issue of shares. Had you are told that? Uh -huh. Acquired 60% of the equity share capital of S Limited in share exchange for two shares of P, two shares of P Limited for three shares in S. For three shares in S. So now let's go back. I want you to determine how many shares did S have? How many shares did S have? So just come to the ordinary share capital. You see for S, this is the company we are acquiring. It's 8,000 each at one. So it's 8,000 divided by one. That means they had 8,000 shares. So if they have 8,000 shares, they have 8,000 shares, but we only acquired 60%. So 60% of 8,000, you get how much? You get 4,800. This is the share we acquired. So, and remember P is acquiring S. So that means if you're acquiring S, for every three shares in S, we pay you through our shares, issue of two shares. For every three shares, we give you two. So S, it had 8,000, we only acquired 60%, so we only acquired 4,800. So if for every three shares, we are giving you two shares, what about in 48, how many shares will you give you? So in that case, our exit are Jangapi, it will be that two shares. So that means P issued that two shares so that it can acquire S. Then you are told that, then you are told that, on this date, the share of P were trading at eight. The shares of P each was trading at eight. So that means we issued that two shares, that 200 shares, and each the market price was eight. So that means the total value of the equity was 25. 600. Now that's the purchase consideration. That means in monetary term, we acquired S for 25,600. Now let me take you back. Uh, for those who are there, for those who are there, uh -huh. for those who are doing published last time, remember we said that ordinary share capital should be recognized at par value with the balance reported to the share premium. Ordinary share capital should be recognized at par value with the balance reported to the share premium. So in this case, we had that two shares. Are we there? But we have seen that from the question. Yeah. We have seen that the share, the par value was one shillings. So it's that two shares each at one. So to the ordinary share capital, we'll take that too. That only take it to the ordinary share capital. But we had that two shares, but each was trading at eight. So that means how much was the, uh, was the premium per share? Can you post there? 
Yeah, Jawahir, I'll share the, the, the pirate paper. I can see you are saying you don't have the pirate paper. I'll share it. Eh? Don't you worry. Mm -hmm. Can see Arnold 7. Yeah, kindly pause there. I need to know the share premium per share. Yeah, correct. I can see it's seven. Eh? Remember, we, the market price was eight, but the power value was one. That means we had a share premium of seven. So if you take that two times seven, in that case, you, you get 22. 400. Now, this is what you take to the share premium. Good. Now, let's go to note number two. We'll go to note number two. Note number two. We are told that as at the date of acquisition, or number one, number one was saying this, eh? the issue of the acquisition of S Limited had not yet been recorded by P. So this one was not recorded. So you record it to the financial statement. So that two, you take it to the owner share capital, 22,400, you take it to the share premium. Good. Now let's go to note number two. As an uh, acquisition date, the fair value of S limited asset, that's the acquired subsidiary, were equal to their carrying amount. The carrying amount is the same as net book value, except for an item of plant, which had a fair value of 2 million in excess of the carrying amount. So what's that? Number two is talking about revaluation. It had a fair value of two. It had a fair value of two million above the carrying amount, above the net book value. So that means it was revalued upward by 2,000. Then let's get the depreciation. We are told that. You get the depreciation there. We are told that still at number one, which had a fair value of two million in excess of the carrying amount. The plant had a remaining use for life for five years as at the acquisition date. S Limited has not revalued its asset. It had a remaining use for life of five years. So that means to get the depreciation, you just take 2,000, you divide by five for you to get the depreciation per annum. Get depreciation per annum. And in this case, you will get an amount of 400. Is it 400? So it's 800, sorry. It's eight. Hundred, then it's two hundred. It's two thousand. You divide by five. You get uh, sorry, it's four hundred. Eh? It when you get four hundred. You get four hundred. Then remember, it was acquired six months to the end of the year. So that means you multiply by six over. So how much do you take the income statement? Now to the income statement, you will take the 200. So that's the depression you take to the income statement. So it's 2000, you divide by five, of which you get 400. But the 400 is the depreciation per annum. Remember you acquired them some six, uh, six months to the end of the year. So times six over 12. So to the income statement, you take 200. And this one, you can take it to the cost of, sale. cost of sales. Good. Now let's go to note number three. Go to note number three. Go to note number three. So note number three, you are told that sales from S Limited to Patterson Limited. Yeah, sales from S to Patterson Limited in the post acquisition period amounted to 8 million. That's what you call the intergroup sales. And they say that intergroup sales, you eliminate in full from both sales and cost of sales. So then you are told that S Limited had made a markup of 40%. So that's markup. Eh? So then you are told that 2.8 million of this good at cost to P Limited were still included in the inventory as at that first March 2015. So how do we account for that? So number three, we have the intergroup balances or intergroup sales, sorry intergroup sales of 8 million. And I say that, how do you account for this? You eliminate in full from both sales and cost of sales. Then we have unrealized profit. We are told that they had made a markup of 40%. That's markup. How do you convert markup to margin? You just take 40 out of 140 times, times, in this case, we are told that shillings 2.8 of this good was still at cost of P was saying could in the inventory. So at the closing stock, to me back 2.8. So if you take 40%, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8, 1.
Divide by 140 times 200, you have 800. Okay, this is what I mean. The intergroup of sale was 8,000. That one we made it in full, regardless whether we sold or we never sold. For unrealized profit, this is the profit we have not realized. Eh? So that means of the 8,000, we sold some items. But at the end, we have what we have not sold. This is 2.8. That means of the 2.8, we have not realized the profit we are supposed to get. Now that's what we call the realized profit. So it's 40 out of 140 times 2,800, you get 800. Now, how do we account for this? We say that for an realized profit, you add to the cost of sales, then you eliminate from the closing stock. You add it to the cost of sale, you eliminate it from the cost uh, closing stock. Good. Now let's go to note number four. Note number four. Now note number four, you are told that. Note number four, you are told that. S limited trade receivable include 800 due from P, which did not agree with the corresponding, uh, with the co uh, corresponding payable. This was due to cash paid by P, which is here to be received by S. So number four, we have intergroup balances. Now you need to get this. So we have P, we have S. So we are told that we had 800, we have 800. We are supposed to be having 800, 800. But in this case, in this case, we are told that this amount did not agree with the corresponding payables. That means S, zero. So that means S payable will show nothing because the amount was, did not agree because they already paid the full amount of 800. But this amount is yet to be received by P. Now that 800, this is what we call the cash in transit. So in this case, these are, uh, in this question, this is a special case. Eh? From the payable side, you do not eliminate anything because they had already accounted for it. But from the receivable side, they had not accounted for it. So that means from the receivable, you eliminate the 800. Then 800, we have a chin up for cash in transit. That means the cash had not yet been received. So that's what we mean by that. Mm -hmm. Then, now let's go to additional information number five. Number five. Number five, you are told that P Limited had a policy of accounting for any non controlling interest at fair value. The fair value of goodwill attributable to non controlling interest in S Limited was 2.4 million. So let's, uh, let's now determine the goodwill there. How do we determine the goodwill? So you can screenshot it. Though I'll, I'll be setting the whole material, so you don't have to screenshot it. Eh? I won't wrap this, I won't wrap this. Good, so now let's go to additional information number five. You need to determine the goodwill. We are looking at goodwill. Now this how we get the goodwill. This how we get the goodwill. We say the goodwill is the difference between the purchase consideration. And how much was the purchase consideration? Now the purchase consideration, the note number one through the issue of share, it was that two times eight, which was 25,600. That's why we completed additional information number one. Eh? Then you raise net assets acquired. Now for the net asset acquired, remember we said that we go to the equity items. We go to the equity, equity items, go to the equity items. So I'm hoping we are there now. We go to the equity items. So now for the equity items, we had only ordinary share capital and retained earnings. Ordinary share capital. Now for the ordinary share capital, ordinary share capital. 
Now, in this case, remember you are getting the goodwill. This is goodwill in S. That's the subsidiary. So the ordinary share capital in S, it was 8,000. So you take the 8,000 there. Then pre-acquisition retained earnings. I repeat that. We say that for the retained earning, you take pre-acquisition at the date of acquisition. So in this case, our retained earning is 13,000. It's 13,000. Now, this is not pre-acquisition. This is the retained earning as a per now. So if you want to get the pre-acquisition retained earning at the date of acquisition, you just take the 13,000. We take the 13,000. We minus, we minus. Now let's go to the income statement. Remember we acquired them during the year. We go to the profit for the year. S Limited made a profit of 6,000. That was the whole year. So that means for six months, it for only six months. Eh? So kinda you can post your answer there. From S, the profit for the year was 6,000. But this one was for the entire year. But remember, they have been our subsidiary for only six months. So how much will be the profit for the six months? So that means it will be 3,000, correct. So you minus. So now let, let me make you understand this. Eh? Let me make you understand this. This is at the end of the year. That is at 31st March 2015. But we acquired them on 1st October. October, I think, 2014. Now, this is the, okay, I mean, this is the, this is the beginning of the year, this is the end of the year. But we acquired them here, six months to the end of the year. So here, we have that our retained earnings is 13,000. But during the entire year, they made a profit of 6,000. So that means here they made 3,000, they made 3,000. So for you to get the pre-acquisition here at the date of acquisition, if you want to get the, how much was the retained earning, eh? you just take the 13,000, you eliminate the profit for the period which they made 3,000, so that at the date of acquisition, you can get that they already had a profit of 10,000. That's why I'm telling you, in an exam, kind of don't compute goodwill. Because if you, this one consumes like 10 minutes computing this, and you get it long, they still get a long answer. Then, if I take you back at note number, note number two, remember note number two, we had a revaluation. Note number two, we had a revaluation. One of the items of S had a fair value of 2,000 above the current amount. So you bring the revaluation of 2,000. So with that, you'll get, the total net asset will be 20. But of the 20, we only acquired them 60%. So you only take 60% of 20,000, which is 12,000. So that means the good will be 25,600. That's the purchase consideration. You raise the net asset acquired, which would be 13,600. Then in this case, you already given the NCI goodwill. Let's go to note number five. Note number five. Note number three, I told that. P Limited has a policy of accounting for any non-controlling interest at fair value. The fair value of goodwill attributable to non-controlling interest in it was 2.4. So the NCI goodwill, it was 2.4. So that means the full goodwill, that means the full goodwill will be 16,000. That will be the full goodwill. Good. So now with that, now with that, I think now we can present our financial statement. Now let's present our financial statement. So required, required number A was the consolidated statement of comprehensive income and number B was the statement of financial Position. So let's start with the income statement. Start with the income statement. So now, another thing I want you to note, whenever you're preparing this financial statement, this will be the heading. We have P, we have S. 
don't write P limited or S limited. Don't write P limited. So someone is asking, how did you, uh, how did, <laughs> did you get NCI? Hence I already given, that was courtesy of note number, courtesy of note number five, you already given, eh? the fair value of NCI goodwill, we already given that. But in case in an exam, they have not provided that. So you only deal with the partial goodwill. Eh? So in that case, you don't add the 24. Good, so now let's continue. Now I was saying something, something that's very important. Now in this case, whenever you are writing the headings, so we have P here, we have S. So now the heading will be the parent. If the parent was P, don't write P limited, kindly. So don't write P limited, eh? so it will be P group. If you write P and S limited, so that one will be wrong. And that one also can, can make all your, your, your presentation to be X. So kindly, whenever you're presenting this, kindly make sure the parent is P, so it will be P group. So now let's go back here. Mm -hmm. Yes, how, Wangari, go on. How come when you're calculating, uh, when you, in the full method of goodwill, how come you didn't Sorry, come again. The apportioned ordinary shares of NCI, you are given a fair value of NCI as 2.4. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So now how in this come, case, uh -huh. how come you didn't, have, how, when you come to the less of the of uh, ordinary shares, how come you didn't deduct the 40% of the 8,000 shares of ordinary shares? Okay, good. Now, so, now in this case, eh, you note that, remember you said that in this case, you're already given the NCI goodwill. So already they have computed it separately and have given you the final result. Now, assuming in this case, you are not given the NCI goodwill, but you're told to use the full goodwill. In that case, that's when you factor the 40%. Let me repeat again, Wangari. Eh? I was saying that in this case, you're already given the NCI goodwill. That means they already taken the purchase consideration minus the 40% of the shares or the net asset. That's when you are given the goodwill. In case you are not given the goodwill, that's when you could have approached the way you are saying it, eh, that you take the 40% of the net asset. I hope you are clear now. Eh? Good. So now in this case, we are saying that the format is very important, the heading. Eh? So it will be P group. P group, consolidated, consolidated statement of comprehensive income. For the year ended, for the year ended that first March, 2015. Good. So kind of note that from uh, that heading. That heading is very important. If you can write P limited, so in some cases when you are marking, so that means we can also disqualify, disqualify the entire working because that one is not a group account. We assume that one is not a group account. So now let's go back to the income statement. I am hoping you are having your question paper there. So you have the revenue. Then you have cost of sales. I'm just arranging the way it is. Then you get your gross profit. Then after that, you have some expenses there. You have some expenses there. We have distribution. We have distribution expenses. Also we have the admin expenses. Then we have the finance. This one is the same as published. Eh? finance expense. Then you get the profit before tax. Then you raise the tax expense. Then you get profit after tax. So now for the revenue, for the revenue, if I take you back, so for P it's 170. So you'll take 170,000 plus, S is a subsidiary. They had a revenue of 84,000. So you'll take 84,000 but times six over 12, only for the six months. 
For the cost of sale, you do the same. For the cost of sales, you do the same. It's 126,000, that's for the parent. Plus, for the subsidiary was 64, that's the cost of sales, as you can see there. So you take 64,000, six over 12. Uh -huh. Then, now let's adjust, you add. Remember we have depreciation. We had the depreciation on revaluation, which was 200, it was 400. Then times six over 12, it was 200. Then there is something we said you need to eliminate. Or uh, before that, we also had another expense. Remember we have unrealized profit. We say that for unrealized profit, you add it to cost of sales. You add it to cost of sales. Then you eliminate from the closing stock. So how much was the uh, unrealized profit? If I remember well, the unrealized profit was 800. It was 800. Then you eliminate, then you eliminate. We say that intergroup sales are eliminated in full from both revenue and cost of sale. Intergroup sales should be eliminated in full from both uh, sales and cost of sale. So intergroup sales was, we are told that P sold goods to S worth 8 million. We to 8 million? We to 8 million. So how much do you get? So give me the answers there. So in this case, you'll get 204,000, then 126,000, you add that 2,000, you add 1,000 minus 8,000. So you'll get 151,000. Then you get the gross profit. The gross profit will be 204, thousand minus the answer. So you'll get 53,000. Then distribution cost, distribution cost. And then you'll note that from the handout I'll send you, eh, I forgot to include this 200. So kindly, kindly, immediately you get the revision, uh, you, you, get, you get the this uh, material. So kindly make sure you add this eh, from the working that I had sent. Eh? So I forgot to include this deposition of the two of the two. Mm -hmm. Then, then I can see Jaffa is asking, are you not supposed to consider 60% of S? No. So when you are consolidating, you are not taking the proportion. The 60% is the control. Eh? So I'll show you where the 60% will be applied. That's the control. Now, I think Jaffa is, uh, is assuming that if you take 64, you only take 60%. No, 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 no. For consolidation, we don't do that. Eh? So in that, we don't do that. Then now let's go to the distribution. Let's go to the distribution expenses. For distribution expenses, you are consolidating everything in this case. The only thing we'll limit is only the period of operation. For distribution cost, we had 4,000. For the parent, it's, this one is 4,000. Now for the, the other one is 4,000, but you only six over 12. So that one you'll get uh, 6,000. So for admin expenses for the parent is 12,000. You add, the other one is 6,400, but in this case, you only take six over 12. So that means you'll get 15,200. Then for the finance cost, it's 600 plus 800 times six over 12. In that case, you'll get 1,000. Then you get the profit before tax. So, Minus 6,000, minus 15,200, minus 1,000. So, so let me recompute again. It's 53,000, minus 6,000, minus 15. Yeah, you get 3,800. So now that's the profit before tax. Now we go to the tax expense. Also for the tax expense, you do the same. Just take the way it is. Eh? The income tax expense was 9,400. The other one was 2,800. So you'll take, uh, for the tax expense, you'll take 9,400 plus 28 times six over 12. So in that case, you'll get 10, 
800. Then you minus. So it's 3800 minus 10. That one in that case, you'll get 20,000. 20,000. Then after you get the profit after tax, you show attributable to number one, what do you take to the parent? And what do you take to the NCI? What do you take to the parent? What do you take to the NCI? So in this case, you only compute for the NCI. Now this I will get for the NCI, the non-controlling interest is 40%. So you take the 40%, then you take profit after tax. The profit after tax. Now the profit after tax, let me take you back here. They made a profit of 6,000, but it's 3,000, it's 6,000 times six over 12, which is 3,000. So that's the profit the, sub, uh, the, associate, uh, the subsidiary made. 6,000, six over 12, which is 3,000. Now let's adjust, let's adjust. Now the NCI, remember it's in S. S, number one, they revalued an asset. They revalued an asset. After they made the revaluation, after they made the revaluation, there was like a depreciation of 200. They never deducted. You deduct the 200. You deduct the 200. Minus, minus, remember also, as the subsidiary sold good to P and they made unrealized profit of eight. That is it. It's 3,000 minus two, minus eight. Now, this one is the depreciation. They had already never deducted, and this one was unrealized profit. So it will be 3,000 minus 1,000, that's 2,000 times 40%. So in that case, you'll get 800. So attributable to the NCI will be 800, but the total profit after tax was 20,000. That means the parent gets, the parent will get 19,200. So that's the balance. Eh? So in this case, so I think most of you are thinking that because the profit after tax was 19,200, to the NCI, you'll take the 40% of 19,200. No, now that's not how you account. To anticipate the NCI, you just take the 40% of the profit after tax, and then you adjust. You don't take 40% of the profit after tax. So you can raise your questions there for the income statement before I prepare the balance sheet. Good, so now let me wrap this. Now we go to the balance sheet. We go to the balance sheet. So it's P group. Consolidated statement of financial position. As at that first March 2015, our shillings are in thousands. So we start with the assets, particularly the non current assets, the non-current assets. So for the non-current assets, we go to the balance sheet. We had the PPE, that's our PPE, PPE. Now for the parent, it's 6,900 plus the subsidiary is 18,900. Now, let me clarify something here. Now to the balance sheet, you don't apportion. Even if it was one month rent of the year, now, to the income statement, we assume that the item accrue evenly. That's when, if it was an income statement, you could have taken 18,900 times six over 12. But to the balance sheet, remember you cannot say that in Mechukua new, but like six months to the end of the year, to Chukua six over 12. Eh? So in this case, for the balance sheet, you take it in full. You don't apportion. You only apportion to the income statement eh? times six over 12. So it's 6,900 for the parent, the full 18,900 for the subsidiary because this is as that. You see for the income statement, it's for the year ended. 
it was only for the year. But for the balance sheet, it's as that. So you include everything. Then remember, there was a revaluation. PRS Limited devalued its asset upward by 2000. But then this 2000, the item was depreciable. It depreciated by 200. So how much do you get? So in that case, you had 6,900. Then you have 18,900. Then we have 2,000 minus the 200. So it was 81,600. Then also we had another item here. Number two, we had investment property. Investment property. Now for the investment property for the investment property is just 2300 then you add 6300 and that one you will get 26 600 then you add goodwill goodwill is part of non current assets and how much was the goodwill the goodwill was 16000 now let's go to the current assets for the current assets we had inventory. Now, inventory for the parent is 12,080 plus the 5,000 in full. You don't apportion. Minus, remember, we said that for unrealized profit, you add it. For unrealized profit, you add it to the income state, uh, you add it to the cost of sales. But you eliminate, we eliminate uh, from the Closing stock. And how much was the nearest profit? It was 800. So it will be 12,080 plus 5,000. You eliminate the unrealized profit. So it will be 16,280. Then we had receivables. Now for the receivable, it's 19, 920. You add 4,900. Also, there was intergroup balances of 800 that did not balance, that did not agree. Eh? Uh, we had intergroup balances of 800, which did not agree, of 800. You eliminated from receivables. So we'll get 16,020. Then we had bank. The bank account, we had 8,000 from the parent, plus 33. And the total, you'll get 11,300. And then you add, remember, we had cash in transit. Since it was not received, so that means we, we need to record it. Eh? This 800 to metal upper, you add it there. In that case, you'll get that your total assets will be 168,400. 168,400. So now let's go to equity and liabilities. Are you getting that? So it's 81,600 plus 26,600 plus 16. Thousand sixteen to eighty sixteen zero twenty seven three hundred and eight hundred. Yeah, it's one sixty eight six hundred. Sorry, then let's go to equity and liability. We start with ordinary share capital. Then we bring share premium. Then we have retained earnings and also we have gotten a revaluation reserve. So no, no, we don't have revaluation. Now revaluation was, that was pre-acquisition. So that one will not affect the uh, consolidated uh, account. That one will not affect there. So that one kind of you might ignore it. So we have retained earnings. Something else we had here, it's the non-controlling interest. Now the non-controlling interest becomes a part of capital. So now, in this case, in this case, you know what we did in note number one? I want you to type for me, how much would be the closing, uh, the ordinary share capital? Now, let me clarify something. Remember we said that for the ordinary share capital and share premium, we only take for the parent we only take for the parent. So in this case, we not take 20,000. We not take 20,000, you add 80,000. No, for ordinary share capital, we said we only take for the parent. So for the parent in this case, it's just 20. So you'll take 20,000 plus 
if I take you back to note number one, when we well, remember the parent company issued its shares, remember we had share issued at par value, which was that 200. The share issued at par value was that 200. So the ordinary share capital will show 23, 200. The ordinary share capital you only take for the parent. This is what we issued. Then from the question, we never had share premium, but when we are acquiring S, this share we issued them at a premium. And the share premium, I can take you back, it was 22,400. Then retained earnings. To me, some in an exam here on our channel now, eh? But I'll come to show you how to compute that. Also, MCI to Kasem on our channel now. You ignore the two. But I'll come to show you how to compute them. Now, let's go to the non current liabilities. Non current liabilities. So how do we show that? So I've seen I've wrapped. So now let's go to the non current liabilities. Now for the non current liabilities, so from the question we had 10% loan note. That one is a free max. You just take the 6,000 you add the 8,000, 6,000 plus 8,000, you get 14,000. Now we go to the current liabilities. How do we get the current liability? For the current liability, we had payables, account payables. And for the account payable, we had 12,300. You add 7,050, the 7,050 in this case. But now, remember I had intergroup balances of 800. In this case, you'll not deduct. Why? Because the amount did not agree because the payable had already paid the payment of 800. That means they had already adjusted. So in this case, you'll not deduct. So this was a special case. So in that case, you'll get 12 plus seven, you get 19,350. And then we have a cruise. For the parent, we had 4,100. Then you add. 2350. And in that you get 6450. 6450. Now get the total. So the total should be 168,600. But in this case, I have not included retained earning and NCI. So now I have told you in an exam, can't they ignore them? So how do we get the retained earnings? So that's start with the retained earnings. Now this I'll get the retained earnings. It's a process and in case you miss anything there, that means you'll get a wrong answer. So now for the retained earnings, first of all, you bring the parent retained earnings, parent retained earnings, if I take you back, the parent retained earnings, it was 7,800. The parent retained earnings, it's 70. 800, then you add investee post acquisition, post acquisition retained earnings, investee. That means in case it had a subsidiary or an associate, you bring that. So in our case, we had a, a subsidiary. At this subsidiary, this was S. So you take 60%, remember you're controlling them 60%, of, and you are taking the post acquisition retained earnings. Now, post acquisition, remember, we've seen that for the six months, for the six months, remember, for the entire year, they had made a profit of 6,000. Now, for the six months, this is 3,000. Now, this deal is what we want, eh? the post acquisition. So you take the 3,000, the post acquisition. Now, let's adjust then. Minus as revalued its asset, and then they never depreciated there was a depreciation of 200 minus S sold good to P and they made unrealized profit of 800. You minus 800. That means you are done. Eh? So that's kind of in an example, uh, ignore retained earning at uh, good with the NCI. So if you take 60% of that, so that means it's 2000 multiplied by 0.6 and it will get 1,200. So that means in that case, 
So to the retained earnings, uh, I mean to the retained earnings, it will be 72,000. So here the retained earnings was supposed to be 7,200. Then let's go to the NCI. How do we compute NCI? How do we compute the NCI? So let me show how to compute the NCI. So I'll compute the NCI. Non-controlling interest. Now remember NCI is in S limited. So you just bring the net asset. You bring the net asset in S. S is our NCI. So we have ordinary share capital. Ordinary share capital. We are looking at S. This is where we have the, remember this is the subsidiary. So that means the NCI is also here. So we have the ordinary share capital, which is 8,000, 8,000. So you bring 8,000. Then they made a revaluation. They made a revaluation of two during the year. Then you get their retained earnings. In this case, you're not getting the post acquisition. Eh? You're just getting the retained earnings. The retained earnings for the subsidiary is 13,000. In this case, you're not looking post and pre, just the total, which is 13,000. It's 13,000, but during the year, <laughs> you, are, you just adjust the way you have that adjusted here. You deduct, there was an expense of 200, that's the depreciation they never deducted. And also during the year, they made unrealized profit of 800. So how much will be remaining? So you'll get 12,000. Then you add the total. So that is 22,000. But then on controlling interest, we only have 40%. Remember, you're controlling them 60%. That means the non controlling interest is the 40%. Eh? And you get that 40% of 22,000, it will be 8,800. Then you add NCI goodwill. Remember, NCI had a good deal of 2,400. Eh? So that means it's total. If you add the 2,400, it'll be getting 11,200. 11,200. Good. So, as a conclusion, eh? in a conclusion, so kindly, for exam purposes, let me repeat, don't stress, your, uh, stress yourself in computing retained earning or the NCI. That means, in case you interpret something here wrongly, that means this one will be wrong. And that means you not get any mark. Eh? So kindly just focus on where you can get the free interest. So now I'll send you the material, but kind of make a uh, kind of remember to rectify that. In that case, I never included the depreciation of 200. The 200, you can make 200. Yeah, but I can still resend it. You can still resend it. So now, So someone is asking, why did we divide the depreciation on the PP? Yet it was for the whole year. It was not for the whole year. Remember, we had just uh, we we made the uh, depreciation six months to the end of the year. Remember, we acquired them on and first October. So from first October to the end of the year, that's just six months. Eh? Yeah, it was not for the whole year. It was from October to the, uh, to that first March. So, hoping there is no other question. So allow me to put a stop on that. So next class still I'll be doing groups. So group is very wide. So we need to do whenever you have a case of a subsidiary and associate. So next class kind of don't, uh, make sure you don't miss. And before next class, kind of go through what we have run. Eh? Mostly the specialized transaction. That's very important. Yeah, how do we adjust for intergroup balances? Then how do we adjust for uh, unrealized profit, intergroup sales, intergroup sale of fixed asset? That's what we'll be looking at. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
I can see George, you are concerned. How, how, how will I get home? Eh? Don't worry about that. Eh? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Don't you worry. Eh? So now, hoping you had an, I enjoyed the class. Kind of hoping you enjoyed the class. So kind of keep on devising, keep on devising, keep on devising. And then also you can get the revision partner for those who are revising from home. Kind of insist, also revision partner can really help, can really help. Eh? And you can take them from Somia Kenya. So I can advise you to take from Somia Kenya because from Somia Kenya, that's, I think those material, eh? also I have gone through them. So they are good, they have been prepared very well. So thank you for your time. And then we can call it a day. So kindly go and revise that and kindly go through what we have learned. Thank you.